Hello. The title of my talk today is Sounds of Space, an art-science collaboration. I'd like to begin by thanking my collaborators, Kim Cuneo, a leading Australian composer and head of music at the Australian National University, and Diana Scarborough, a multimedia artist from Cambridge, UK. Begin with an outline of my talk. I will start off by introducing the sounds of space and then present some sounds from the Halley VLF receiver in the Antarctic before embarking on a sound-led journey from Earth orbit to beyond the galaxy. I will then describe our art-science collaboration in some detail. Our planet naturally produces a wide variety of radio emissions and these radio waves are generated by two principal processes lightning activity during thunderstorms and geomagnetic storms, ultimately driven by the sun. These radio transmissions are at the lower end of the radio spectrum, typically in the range between 100 hertz and 10 kilohertz, and they can be best detected by large antennae, either in space or on the ground. Now the radio spectrum covers a broad range of frequencies between 3 kilohertz and 300 gigahertz and is used for a wide variety of applications from radio astronomy and satellite communications at the highest frequencies to maritime radio and navigation at the lowest frequencies. And at the lower end of the spectrum, below the lowest frequency limit of the maritime radio navigation signals, we have Earth's natural radio which is in the ELF-VLF frequency range. The frequency range of the human ear extends over three orders of magnitude, ranging from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Earth's naturally occurring radio signals lie within this audio frequency range. Now, sound waves are vibrations of air molecules, but these emissions are a form of electromagnetic radiation and they cannot be heard directly. However, the recorded emissions can be converted to audio files and played back as sound, revealing a series of weird and wonderful noises. More generally, sound waves cannot travel in the near-perfect vacuum of space. However, electromagnetic and gravitational waves can both propagate in this medium. Taking these signals and converting them to sound is what enables us to hear the sounds of space. The Spectrum Analyzer is a software tool that enables us to visualize the audio signals by plotting the amplitude of the sound on the frequency versus time graph. I'll begin my discussion of the um, sounds by talking about ground sounds, and by these I mean signals that are detected on the ground. Now Halley Research Station, operated by the British Antarctic Survey, is a fantastic location to record the sounds of space as it is magnetically connected to the outer radiation belt where some of the radio waves are generated. It is also electromagnetically quiet, being far from human society. The Halley VLF receiver consists of two orthogonal 58 meter squared single loop antennae and it is specifically designed to detect the magnetic fluctuations of the Earth's low-frequency radio waves. The weak signals it detects are amplified, processed electronically, and subsequently digitized at 96 kilohertz. The VLF-ELF data from Halley are used primarily to investigate the science of space weather storms, to help understand space weather impacts on the Earth's climate system and for lightning detection as part of a worldwide lightning detection network. As a remarkable spin-off, conversion to audio reveals a host of amazing sounds. The main signals a ground-based VLF receiver detects originate in lightning activity. Each lightning flash emits a short radio pulse, known as a spheric, which covers a wide range of frequencies. These are heard as short cracks and appear as vertical lines in a spectrogram. 
The spherics that we detect in the Antarctic typically come from the Amazon and Congo basins, both of which are over 8,000 kilometers away. So let's take a listen to some lightning spherics detected by the Halley VLF receiver. Spherics may travel even further, up to halfway around the globe. Higher frequencies travel slightly faster than lower frequencies, so these signals undergo dispersion. The recorded signals are known as tweaks and have a pronounced ringing nature. Some of the radio waves associated with lightning leave the atmosphere and leak out into near-Earth space. The signals may be guided by the Earth's magnetic field and received in the opposite hemisphere. They may even be reflected in the opposite hemisphere and detected in the same hemisphere as the original lightning strike. Higher frequency waves typically travel faster than lower frequency waves. The recorded waves have a characteristic descending tone and are known as whistlers. Pure note whistlers travel along a single field line or closely spaced group of field lines and are heard as a clear whistling sound. Diffuse whistlers, on the other hand, travel on multiple field lines which have different lengths and the recorded signal sounds swooshy. Another prominent signal type, known as chorus, is generated deep within the magnetosphere itself. Explosions on the Sun cause bursts of charged particles of magnetic field that travel out into space. When they reach the Earth, they can tear open the magnetic field, causing a geomagnetic storm. During these storms, energetic electrons are injected into the Earth's inner magnetosphere. The electrons enter near midnight, and drift around dawn to the day side and are restricted to the region outside the plasmasphere. The injection process leads to the formation of anisotropic electron distribution functions which in turn excite plasma waves known as chorus. Chorus emissions are consequently enhanced during geomagnetic storms. The waves are strongest on the dawn side of the planet from 4 to 9 Earth radii as can be seen from this statistical survey using wave data from seven satellites. These waves accelerate electrons to very high energies in the Earth's outer radiation belt. Studying these effects is important since these so-called killer electrons can damage satellites. At the British Antarctic Survey, we use global maps such as these in computer models to produce space weather forecasts. The most common form consists of a multitude of rising tones in the frequency range from 1 to 5 kilohertz. These emissions are known as chorus because they often resemble the twittering of birds in the dawn chorus. Sometimes the signatures are more widely spaced and can exhibit unusual complexity. For example, this figure shows some strong, rapidly rising tones.
Plasmospheric hiss is another important magnetospheric emission. Unlike chorus, plasmospheric hiss is a broadband structureless signal that often resembles audible hiss. Plasmospheric hiss is also enhanced during geomagnetic storms. The waves are strongest on the day side of the planet from 2 to 4 Earth radii. Plasmospheric hiss is largely responsible for the slot region between the inner and outer radiation belt. We are now going to leave the Earth behind and listen to some natural radio emissions collected in near-Earth space. Whistlers can also be detected by satellites in space. This spectrogram shows a brief series of whistlers below 6 kHz. These whistlers were detected by the Emphasis instrument on the Van Allen Probe A satellite back in 2015. Chorus can also be detected in situ in space. This spectrogram shows chorus emissions as a population of short, very intense rising tones between 0.5 and 1 kHz. These emissions were recorded by the Emphasis instrument on Van Allen Probe B back in 2012. Natural radio is also produced on other planets in the solar system. Chorus has been detected on each of the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. This spectrogram shows signals recorded by the Juno satellite as it approached Jupiter back in 2016. These emissions were recorded at a distance of 128 Jovian radii or approximately 9 million kilometers from the planet. This is the Jovian bow shock, where particles streaming from the sun first encounter the planet's massive magnetic field. Jupiter has lightning storms which generate whistlers just like they do on Earth. This spectrogram shows a series of whistlers at Jupiter recorded by Voyager 1 back in 1979. Chorus is also generated in Jupiter's radiation belt. This spectrogram shows chorus at Jupiter, recorded by Voyager 1, also in 1979. Voyager 1 crossed the heliopause and entered interstellar space in August 2012. In this recording, time has been compressed so that three years play back in about 18 seconds. The events we hear are plasma oscillations in interstellar space, excited by solar activity. Most electromagnetic emissions are not in the audio frequency range. However, they can be converted to audio signals by scaling the observed frequencies such that they fall into the audio range. Rosetta detected magnetic fluctuations from comet 67P Kuryumov Gerasimenko. These variations occurred at a rate of 40 to 50 mHz, well below the audio frequency range and they were first detected 
when the Rosetta spacecraft was about 100 kilometers from the comet. These emissions have been used to create a fully artistic piece by the German composer Manuel Semft. Saturn is also a source of intense radio emissions. This spectrogram was recorded by the Cassini spacecraft in November 2003. The recording has been shifted downwards in frequency by a factor of 44, and it has also been compressed so that 27 minutes is played back in 73 seconds. We are now going to leave the solar system behind and listen to three galactic sounds. A pulsar is a highly magnetized neutron star with a mass greater than the sun but a radius of only 10 to 15 kilometers. Radiation is beamed out along the magnetic poles and pulses of radiation may, may be received as the beam crosses the earth. This is a recording of the brightest pulsar in the northern sky from the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank. The rotation period of this pulsar is approximately 0.7 seconds. Different pulsars spin at different rates. This is a recording of the Vela pulsar from the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. This pulsar rotates about 11 times a second. Some pulsars spin much faster. This is a recording of the brightest so-called millisecond pulsar, also recorded by the Parkes radio telescope. This pulsar is rotating about 174 times a second. Millisecond pulsars are thought to be old, rapidly rotating neutron stars, which have been spun up by attracting matter from a companion star in a close binary system. We are now going to leave the galaxy behind and listen to two incredible extragalactic sounds. Gravitational waves were first predicted by Einstein in 1916 and finally observed nearly 100 years later by the LIGO interferometers in America. It was the first ever detection of gravitational waves, which are ripples in space-time produced by violent cosmic events. This chirp comes from the merger of two black holes that took place 1.3 billion years ago. On the 17th of August 2017, LIGO made the first detection of gravitational waves from two colliding neutron stars that took place 130 million years ago. This was the first ever cosmic event observed in both gravitational waves and light. The light-based observations showed that heavy elements such as platinum and gold were produced by the collision, solving the age-old question of where these elements are made. In 2017, we set up a multidisciplinary art-science collaboration to exploit these amazing natural sounds and make them more accessible to wider audiences. In 2018, we developed a show which was first performed at the Anglia Ruskin University as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. This show included a science talk followed by a performance with animations, soundscape, music and contemporary dance. A second show at Bass also featured live music from Kim and his son, Samurai. The following year, we showcased a new and immersive performance at Stories Field Centre 
in Eddington as part of the Cambridge Festival of Ideas. At this event, the dancers moved amongst the audience as they responded to the sound-led, data-driven journey. The dancers used this as a scratch night to test the reaction of the audience. In a separate venture, the sounds of space from Halley were incorporated into an update of the space simulation video game Elite Dangerous in December 2018. In this collaboration, I work with Frontier Developments, the creator of Elite Dangerous, to incorporate the eerie sounds into the new gameplay. In any one of over 400 billion stellar systems, players can now use a new analysis mode to discover more about their surroundings. The new mode, called the Full Spectrum System Scanner, features the simulated sounds of radio emissions from exoplanets in remote stellar systems based on the Halley VLF recordings. In 2018, we started work on an album, combining sounds from the VLF receiver at Halley with original music. For this project, we chose a particularly active 24-hour period to set to music. Kim went to work and matched the day of audio with piano music that he conceived of and played within another 24-hour period. The resulting album, Aurora Musicalis, was released in May 2020. It is partly a soundscape drawn from our most mysterious continent, and partly a response to the natural radio sounds of our planet. It invites us to relax and enjoy the sounds of space set to ambient music on the grand piano. The album, which is available for free on Bandcamp, comprises 11 tracks enabling us to experience the changing sounds throughout the day. It also includes a three minute compilation of the space sounds, both with and without the music. It also features a music video featuring images from the Bass Image Collection. Our second album, Celestial Incantations, was released in June 2021. This album builds on the first album, 
by introducing a whole new spectrum of space sounds, together with a huge musical palette, including orchestral instruments, traditional instruments and electronics. The album invites the listener to consider the vastness of space, imagining time and space in the grandest sense, and embark on a spectacular journey of sound. Starting off at Earth and moving outwards, the album features compositions inspired by and including the sounds of our planet, Mars, a comet, Jupiter, Saturn, interstellar space and a galactic pulsar. The album concludes with a track featuring the sound of the merger of two black holes as evidenced by the first observed gravitational wave, an almost unbelievable ripple in space-time that Einstein doubted humans could ever capture. So let's finish by watching a short video featuring clips from the album and take a journey from Earth to beyond the galaxy. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and will be happy to take any questions either in the chat or via email.